Hi, and welcome you all to our, our panel presentation showcasing our newly tenured and two newly promoted faculty and their, their research. And so first I wanna thank Dr. Brian Heisterkamp, um, who is the, the member of a college evaluation committee. He has served on the college evaluation committee many years. And he's also the, the college curriculum committee as well too. And he's also the PI for the multi-million dollar grant entitled here to career from the Department of Education. So I'm very, very thankful that he graciously accept my, my invitation to serve as facilitator for today's panel presentation. And today's panel presentation showcase three faculty who were either newly tenured and promoted or promoted to full professor. So our first um, presenter is Dr. Alexandra Cavalera, um, who is the, the, the English department professor and she just got tenured and promoted to associate professor. So congratulations, Alexandra. And then she's also the, the director of the, the Center for the Study of Correctional Education. And I asked her, what are the things that she's most proud of her own scholarly research? She said one of the things that she's most proud of is her publication co-author was incarcerated students because it is important to her that incarcerated people are an integral part of the research that is produced about prison. And the second piece of her scholarly work that she's most proud of is the, the journal article that appeared in the literary literacy in composition studies, where she applied a clear lens to analyze the way the prison education program are presented. Again, congratulations, Dr. Caballero, for your promotion to associate professor. We look forward to hearing your, your presentation today. And today's second presenter is Dr. Jenching Davison. She is an art historian and the exhibition curator, and she was promoted to full professor last year. She received the top honors in 2006 at the University of Manchester for her PhD dissertation. And then she received a, P, uh, a British ESRC fellowship to develop the manuscript into her monograph, which is entitled Staging Art and Chineseness the politics of transnationalism and global expositions. And that was published by University of Manchester Press. So thank you so much, Dr. Davison for presenting your research and also congratulations for your extraordinary accomplishment and your promotion to full professor. And the third presenter we have today is Dr. Chess Sweeney from the English department and he received his promotion to full professor. And he's proud of the, he, that he has been working so hard over the past 30 years to develop his poetry and knowledge of poetry, largely because he's never satisfied with his own work for so long. And he tend to continually pushing himself to grow in new way, to stretch beyond his own limit of what is possible. His most recent project, for example, it's a book length poem written as a single sentence in the future tense, a book of prophecies for an age of quantum physics, a project which is very fascinating and impossibly challenging. Again, congratulations, Dr. Sweeney, for your promotion to full professor as well, too. So now without further ado, I would like to turn um, the whole you know, floor to Dr. Brian Heisterkamp, the facilitator of today's panel presentation, showcasing three faculties, their scholarly work. The virtual floor, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dean Chong. Um, it's, you know, one of the things that I really enjoy is um, in terms of service on our campus is working on the College Evaluation Committee because it enables me to be, you know, read about, learn about all the wonderful work that we do across the college. And we're going to hear from three of those folks today. Excuse me. Um, so we'll start with um, Dr. Alexander Caballero. Um, and let me just say we're going to um, do the three presentations first, and then we'll have time at the end for any questions. So jot down any questions that you have, and we'll get to those after we hear from our three speakers. So um, Dr. Caballero is an associate professor, professor in the English department and director of the Center for the Study of Correctional Education on our campus. Her research focuses on three interconnected areas, 
liter literacy studies, critical prison studies, and queer studies. At the heart of this work is her interest in the silences and gaps in the official record, the edges of canonical tradition, and the populations at the margins, <clears throat> pardon me, at the margins of institutions. Her research has appeared in journals such as Literacy and Composition Studies, Enculturation, and Present Tense. She believes that truly meaningful pedagogy happens when we put into practice the belief that people deserve more dignity, humanity, and freedom than institutions and existing power structures give them. Dr. Caballero. Thank you all so much. Thank you um, to the college for putting this together and thank you all for being here on a Friday afternoon. Um, so today I, I basically want to spend my allotted time kind of telling you some stories about my current research and how it came to be. You know, I don't know if any of you in this virtual room can identify with this feeling, but when I finished my dissertation, which focused on rhetorical and literacy education in the queer community, I just had no desire to ever look at that thing again as long as I lived ever. I wanted to put it in a closet and never let it see the light of day again. Um, and I mean, that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but what I was really looking for was a way to integrate these interests in queer studies with my work as a prison educator, because that had come over the course of my time in my PhD program really meaningful to me. So that desire to integrate these interests and the desire to never again ever look at my dissertation was what propelled me to this current project. And it eventually led me to this organization called LGBT Books to Prisoners. This organization, LGBT Books to Prisoners, is based in Madison, Wisconsin, and they send free books and resources to queer and trans incarcerated people all across the United States. Um, I'm sure that most of the people on this Zoom call are pretty familiar with the problems um, of our current prison system. I'm sure that most of us know that the U.S. has the highest rate of incarceration in the world and that one of the most really striking and very disturbing features of this crisis is the disproportionate rate at which marginalized people are incarcerated. So people of color, immigrants, disabled people, and LGBTQ people are all imprisoned at really remarkably higher rates. But one thing that we really don't know a lot about um, are the specific experiences of queer and trans people in prisons across the United States. There's not a whole lot of data um, on that right now. But what we do know suggests it kind of follows similar patterns, right, that they're both overrepresented in the prison system and they're subjected to far higher rates of violence in prisons. So for these reasons, I think it's really important that we study the ways that queer and trans people resist these conditions and create community and forge these life affirming and life sustaining practices to survive incarceration. And one of the many ways that this is done is through literacy practices like book reading and letter writing and um, educational and support group formation. LGBT Books to Prisoners is one or one of many organizations really that kind of helps facilitate that. And thankfully for me, this organization, which has been sending books and resources out for over 10 years, has archived every letter that they've gotten from inside prisons which was, has resulted in an archive that contains, by a conservative estimate, tens of thousands of letters. So um, I'd actually like to have us look at one of those letters now. Oops. In December 2016, LGBT Books to Prisoners received a letter from Barry in Oklahoma. Dear sir, he writes, for several years, I have hoped to find a program that could offer LGBT-oriented fiction, books, novels, and romance stories to like-minded inmates such as myself. It is my sincerest hope that your services can provide books like these, as there are several other gay men here that would be interested in your service as well. It, I believe, is so vitally important that offenders that are members of the LGBTQ community and are currently incarcerated have both a voice and equality. It is my sincerest hope that organizations like yours will help to bridge such gaps. I thank you for your time and attention in this matter and wish each and every one of you the best of holiday seasons. So what I really love about Barry's letter, and it's, it's why I, I often always start with it, is that we see two different things happening. 
the first, he's, he's telling us about this gap. He's telling us about this need for materials that reflect LGBTQ identity and experience. But at the same time, his letter goes beyond their immediate needs by pointing to the ways that he and his fellow LGBT incarcerated people are silenced by virtue of that incarceration. And he offers a sense of hope that books and other resources can actually begin to change those material conditions more broadly, right? Beyond just a single person in a single prison. So to me, it really reads like an act of hope. So in my current research, I'm drawing on a collection of more than 500 letters just like this one in order to understand the role of literacy practices in the lives of queer and trans incarcerated people. And what I've observed so far, I'm still very much you know, in these letters and swimming in these letters, but what I've observed so far is that organizations like this one create a vision of a future that's built on community care by fostering connections between queer and trans incarcerated people in prisons, within these prison facilities, and also between queer and trans incarcerated people and free world people, so reaching beyond the confines of the prison. Um, this, the work that LGBT Books to Prisoners does enables these communities to be formed outside of the boundaries of the prison industrial complex, which is a system that is really built on and sustained by isolation and violence. So this model of what we, in my field, we call it literacy sponsorship, invites scholars and teachers, I think in a variety of settings, to deepen their work by moving beyond simply mitigating conditions of harm to enacting broader social change. So I wanna share with you a couple of themes that I've noticed um, across letters. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna display a few letters because I think their materiality is really important and bringing the letter into this virtual room allows me to invoke the presence of the person who wrote it. I do realize that you may not actually be able to read most of them right, as they're displayed, but I'm gonna read uh, relevant sections out loud. So here's the first one. So the first, um, the first theme that I've noticed is that these letters document abuses in the system, and they give us a window into the treatment of queer and trans incarcerated people. So Brandon writes, I have been retaliated against pretty bad because of my homosexuality. I'm an ex-gang member who has always covered up my sexuality and portrayed something that I wasn't until a couple of years ago. I finally decided to just be the real me, so I'm writing a book about it. But the sad part is that the officers and inmates here look down upon us and do whatever they can to make us miserable. Just last month, the officers shook down my cell and tore up and threw away a lot of my stuff. Most of my pages that I've been writing on my book were tore up, my dictionary and thesaurus were tore up. And as a writer, hearing something like that profoundly, profoundly hurts my heart. Um, we see another example of this in a letter from Jeremy, who actually has to ask the organization to stop sending him anything. Jeremy writes, whoever is in the mail room really don't like gays or me. They won't let nothing gay in here. I understand that some people don't believe in same sex relationships, but why are we looked at as being wrong for what we are? Most of the prisons I've been in understand it's part of life. And even if they don't approve, they don't sit there and disrespect us. I just want out of prison. Anyway, please don't send me anything else. I'll write when I can get something for, from y'all. Thank you for trying. Take care and be safe. Love always, Jeremy. The second theme I've noticed is that the relationships developed through books and through letter writing become a deeply meaningful resource in the fight for survival in prison. Um, so two examples of that, Miguel writes to say, I wanna thank y'all for being there to help those of us who are trapped in this hell. It is a comfort to know that there are people out there who don't think of you as a piece of trash or a monster just because you broke a law or three. Um, April writes in saying, I was having a really bad month of June. My husband divorced me this year. My family all don't offer any help. People have come to call friends in here are all going home. And in June, it was all really building up of my emotional stability. Then I got your books. The thing that made the difference was a simple sheet of paper with three words. You are important. It actually brought me to tears. It totally hit the spot. Your choice of words was perfect for fixing a wounded soul. The third theme that I've noticed through these letters is that 
They foster um, strong literacy and information networks in prison. So getting these books actually causes these kinds of networks to be, um, to be formed. They become communal resources in order to fill those gaps that we noticed in Barry's letter and provide information on queer and trans identity. So James, for example, tells the organization that the gay novels they send are loved by all of us. He says, I pass them around to others that don't get many books from the inside, from the outside. By the time all of us have read them, the covers are falling off. Joseph says something similar. Um, he says, I've been in prison for 38 years straight, and sadly, what I've seen on gay books has not gotten better. In all these years, I've not seen an institution's library purchase a single gay book to put on its shelves. Other gay books donated hit the shelves and vanish, never to be seen again. Now what I do is I put my gay books on the pass around. Guys see that we share and then the books are made available to us. Claudia, this is my last example, writes in to ask actually for books for her and her wife. She says, my wife and I are both currently housed in an austere housing unit after being given a write up for a hug I gave her. I don't know how long they'll keep us housed here, but I'm unable to see her. We are locked in separate pods. I know she needs books to help her from going crazy. And so what we see in these two letters, in all of these letters, is that the books are facilitating these opportunities to provide comfort and to learn about queer and trans identity and to create this community, this shared sense of us through a literacy network. And this is pretty remarkable in an institution that attempts to curb really any such efforts at community care and support. So by way of conclusion, um, I think what we see from these, this collection of letters is that books and letters provide really extraordinary moments of possibility and resistance. When I was doing my interviews, I asked a volunteer for, from this organization why she thought this work was important. I asked her what it meant to her to do this. And she said to me, because books help people survive and our work insists that we are all in the same world. Now, of course, I'm an English professor, so I love this kind of sentiment, right? That, you know, books help people survive and they break down barriers to insist that incarcerated and free world people are all part of a single community. But what I've seen from these letters is that is actually quite literally true in a material sense that these books and these letters and these resources are helping to create really life affirming and life sustaining connections and practices. So thank you all so much for being here and for being a witness with me to this work and these voices. Thank you, Dr. Caballero. All right, our next speaker is Professor Jane Chin Davidson. Um, she's professor of art history and global cult cultures on our campus. Uh, Professor Davidson is an art historian curator whose research focuses on transnationalism in relation to her performance, feminism, ecofeminist, Chinese identity, and global exhibitions of contemporary art. She has published in numerous peer reviewed journals, such as the Journal of Contemporary Chinese Art, Third Text, and the Journal of Visual Culture. She was awarded top honors with the Distinguished PhD post postgraduate at the University of Manchester receiving a British ESRC fellowship at the Cultural Theory Institute and the Getty Research Institute postgraduate fellowship, Dr. Davidson. Hi, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dean Chuang for hosting us and introducing us. And thank you, Professor Hachikan for it's really nice that you're um, moderating this panel. And, um, Dr. Cavallero, I mean, that was great. Thank you. I'm, I used to teach at uh, University of Houston in the prison, in the men's state prison. And so I, I love your project. It's really fantastic. Um, <clears throat> let me share my screen, if you don't mind. There we go. Is that visible? Is, is that viewable, you guys. 
Okay, good. Um, I have to apologize. I uh, lost my internet right at 12 o'clock. Um, I can see the guy outside right now. He's working. And so my husband got his phone out and made me a mobile hotspot, thank goodness. And um, if, I, if, I, if it doesn't crash, I, I'll be really lucky. So uh, bear with me. Um, <clears throat> pausing at the benchmark of full professor, this seemed like a really great moment to take inventory of my scholarly contributions to the discipline of art history. Um, so I'm taking the opportunity to review my, the, the logic of my research over the course of my tenure at CSUSB. Uh, my current project aligns with the new BA in art history and global cultures that we inaugurated. I see some of my colleagues here uh, in 2020. Um, and uh, the collection of essays I'm co-editing with Amelia Jones at USC uh, presents contemporary art in a global framework. This isn't the cover, but we don't have the cover, but it, this is the series in which it belongs. Uh, it will be published by Blackwell in 2023. Uh, Amelia and I are working with about 40 authors as we speak. Uh, I'm writing an essay for this volume though, and um, it will be focusing on the history of global exhibitions in relation to contemporary art, uh, global expositions, should I say, uh, the biennials and triennials, quinquennials like the Documenta in, in uh, Kassel, Germany, that will be upcoming this year. I, I plan on going to that as well. See if I can make this work. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> um, my dissertation research was uh, focusing on performance art and global expositions. I mean, it's kind of an odd coupling, uh, but beginning with the historical present day structures of exhibitionary complexes, whether they're institutional, social, or political constructions, it was um, really important to, to understand how these uh, expositions were uh, works of empire, should we say. It was, um, so taking this moment, it was really interesting for me to think about what made me want to investigate them in the first place, and then also to see where it has led me now. One of the first peer-reviewed essays I ever published was titled The Global Art Fair and the Dialectical Image for the journal Third Text. And here I trace the genealogy of the Venice Biennale, the very first global exposition of contemporary art. And my essay argues that the 1895 biennial was closely associated with the colonial world's fairs. They were the penultimate uh, showcases of colonial empire at the time. Uh, the, for instance, the 1893 World Columbian Exposition in Chicago was, was dedicated to Christopher Columbus. Um, and that was the occasion that established Columbus Day. I had written that these expositions were, were the places where the work of art was first demonstrated that they were produced solely by European and American nations. And conversely, the classification of all other cultures were considered as ethnographic artifacts to regions subordinate to empire. And um, this made it possible for both art and ethnographic objects to be essentialized according to nation. And so now what we understand as Western art in contemporary terms is directly related to this aesthetic essentialism. It's kind of coined this term aesthetic essentialism. Um, at the 1889 Paris Exposition, for instance, which is, this is part of that article for third text, uh, the display of the fine arts were served, served as the important model for proving what was civilized uh, by juxtaposition with uh, displays of what was considered as uncivilized. And at the highest end of the scale were the palaces of the fine arts, the temples filled with precious objects, 
of transcendence, and at the bottom of the scale, of course, were the anthropological specimen, along with the, their handicraft, their utility. The different peoples were displayed in their natural habitats, staged to represent Darwinian's ages of human development. And um, in my research, I had found that Otis T. Mason, who was writing in 1890, described the anthropological display. And he, quote, said, it was possible to see that there were 12 types of Africans besides Javanese, Tonkinese, Chinese, Japanese, and other Oriental peoples living in native houses, wearing native costumes, eating native food, practicing native arts and rites on the esplanade side by side with the latest inventions with the whole civilized Oh, no. We lost her. I think we lost connection. This world as spectators oh, oh, and civilized that needed to be civilized by the role of the World's Fair. And here I made the connection to the role of the 1895 Venice Biennale, which was to celebrate the fine arts of the European nations solely and not the so called uncivilized world of the Africans, the Javanese, the Tonkinese, the Chinese, the Japanese, and other Oriental peoples. The logic of the separation of the fine arts and anthropology by nations at the World's Fairs remains in this disciplinary difference between anthropology and art to this day. In 2016, I had published my essay for the Journal of Chinese Contemporary Art, showing how China's artistic expression was not represented at the Venice Biennale until the 1990s, a hundred years after the inauguration of the first biennial. In 1993, director and curator Akila Bonita Oliva had included in the international group show Taiwanese artist Li Mingsheng, in addition to 14 artists from China. And uh, this article goes on to explain the official pavilions that were dedicated to Taiwan in 1995, to Hong Kong in 2001, and to the country China in 2005. This is how long it took before uh, China was represented in the global exposition. The study of global exhibitions was the foundation then of my book, Staging Art and Chineseness, published in 2020, which was radically transformed from my dissertation. I mean, things changed so much since I uh, published my dissertation in 2006. Um, you know, 14 years later, China exploded. Their mu museums have uh, replicated by hundreds in, in China. And so I updated the research, um, even from my peer-reviewed journal articles in my book, um, chapter four really, uh, you know, presents a new version of the global art fair and the dialectical image. And chapter five uh, brings a new perspective to the archive of Chinese and the global exposition and the museum. And much of that uh, chapter focuses on the journal of contemporary Chinese art article that I had published. Perhaps the most important theorist, curator and director in the history of global exhibitions uh, was Okwe Enwazor, the first African and black curator and director of Documenta 11 in 2002, and the first black director and curator of the Venice Biennale in 2015. I mean, things move at a slow crawl in um, global expositions and in the fine art world, frankly. When 
when Okwe and Wazor passed away suddenly in 2019, my colleague Alpesh Patel and I uh, brought together other art historians at the College Art Association conference in 2020 um, to pay homage to his really important influence on global expositions. And Wazor's model for the 2002 documenta, for instance, um, was to innovate the ways in which artists and theorists could come together in the space of exhibitions. He had expanded that show and branched out to global locations, five different locations that were never included as uh, global expositionary spaces, such as Lagos in Africa, New Delhi in Asia. And, and now, global exhibitions are in every single country. I mean, the Gwangju Biennial in Korea is really an important uh, global exposition now. But after our conference panel in which we brought together many different contributors discussing how Enwazor was so influential to our research on global exhibitions and in curating in general, I was approached by Chika Okale Agalu, who invited me to publish this panel, the panel papers in the journal that Enwazor had founded. Um, I have a little note on my, my, uh, my page, my website page that says my internet's unstable. So I hope you're getting all of this gone. But anyways, um, after our conference panel, um, the uh, chief editor of Inca Contemporary African Art asked us, invited us to uh, edit the special issue dedicated to the memory of Okwe and Wazor. And it was such a huge honor to be included because this, this uh, particular journal, really important contemporary African art journal was founded by Okwe and Wazor. So we uh, finished this incredible um, project uh, with, you can see all the different contributors to this project who wrote about migration politics, who wrote about um, many different ways in which the global exposition today can represent culture, can represent nations in a way that doesn't reflect empire anymore. Um, and uh, it was uh, this particular um, project that has continued uh, with uh, my uh, co-editor Alpesh Patel and I, um, as we um, just a couple of weeks ago uh, have been bringing this work to different museums around the world. <laughs> Here's um, Shremek Strozek uh, and uh, Alpesh and I at, this, at conversation with the Zehenta uh, National Gallery in Warsaw, Poland just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and um, Shremek had contributed an essay about um, African art in Poland. And so this was a wonderful talk uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we're, we're really uh, expanding out to different museums um, and with different contributors to that special issue to continue this dedication. We think that um, Okwe and Wazor deserves the great commemoration for his um, great influence on global exhibitions. Um, but my research is really quite expansive, um, just about, uh, not just about global expositions, but as I said, a really, you know, unique match with performance because uh, one of the main um, arguments I make is that exhibitions perform to their audiences. And uh, this is, Another image from my book, um, this is the artist who actually created the cover. Um, her name is Yuck King Tan, and she is from the Australia. 
Um, and she had hired this elderly grandmother, Grandma Lam, um, in this piece that she is uh, presenting, that she that I'm taking a, a still from, um, also in the cover of the, of the book, but this is a very wonderful part of the video installation that I, I captured. Uh, but uh, um, Grandma Lam here, her ordinary job is to uh, every day pick up recycling from all the businesses in Hong Kong. So here she's uh, pushing Yaking Tan's um, creation of a laser cut line out of cardboard. But her, her ordinary job every day is just to go around all the businesses with a cart and push the cardboard to the um, recycling center. And then at the recycling center, she gets paid. Um, in this particular day, she really literally takes this laser cut cardboard lion to the recycling center. And um, Yaking Tan asks her to go a certain route and she stands in front of the HSBC lion that Yaking Tan is uh, modeling her cardboard lion after <laughs> the bronze lion um, at the bank. I mean, it's really, really a wonderful piece because you go through the streets of Hong Kong with uh, Lam Po Po and um, you see that she is like hustling traffic to get her um, to get her um, her recycling to the recycling center, um, and also you all you also see this line taken to the recycling center, which is really sort of tragic. Uh, but you can get her point in that you know what do we in this age of global warming and you know environmental crisis, what do we value? I mean, how can we sustain our lives forever um, in thinking about wealth and money um, when our environmental lives are at stake um, and left to little old women to carry through to the recycling center? Um, this chapter in my book explores uh, ecofeminism and labor as a feminist ideal, because uh, the works of, of artists like Yakin Tan really shows us that you know there there are different priorities in life, and we, we really need to address them, even in the arts. And with that, um, with my short little introduction of where I'm at with my work. I'm really glad to have this uh, sort of stopping point to think about the path of my research. Um, and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to have shared it with you today. Thank you. So much, Dr. Davidson. Really fascinating. Now our last speaker today is Dr. Chad Sweeney. Professor Sweeney is professor in the English department on campus, and he specializes in teaching creative writing. Dr. Sweeney has published six books of poetry, including Little Million Doors, which received the Night, Book, Night Book Books Prize, and it was nominated for the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award. And he also wrote Parable of Hide and Seek, as well as two books of translation. Dr. Sweeney led workshops in San Francisco with at-risk youth, and in bilingual classrooms for 15 years before earning his PhD at Western Michigan University and joined the faculty on our campus in 2011. Dr. Sweeney. Yay. <laughs> All of a sudden it's my turn. It's a strange transition. Thank you so much, Brian. And thank you, Ray Ling, um, for uh, all the good work you do and for setting this up. And to, to the genius Dr. Davidson and the genius Caviaro, my God, what incredible work you're doing and what presentations. I can, I can tell that you're just amazing teachers. If I were in those classes, I would be fascinated. I'd be so awake um, and stimulated. So, well, gosh, there's just so much to talk about. Uh, thanks, Dave, thanks for coming. What I, 
what I'm what what I want to say is um, it's a little bit overwhelming to try to explain, but I, I would say that my my various books and projects and what I was talking about with Ray Ling about what I was most proud of, I guess, is just my effort to continually push and grow and use use poetry as a growth uh, as a growth vehicle. I am autistic and um, poetry for me, I think, has been a way to reconcile emotional valences with a kind of math science brain. All of my autistic uncles and aunts are like physicists, computer programmers. One guy's a business, went to NYU and now runs this big law firm. They're all like super rational, super intellectual people. And I was going that direction. I was an engineering major and I, and I just decided I wanted to be emotionally alive. I wanted to what it, what it feels like to have autism is there's a disconnect between emotions and your and your rational brain. The rational brain is very powerful and the, the emotional the emotions are there, but there's like this disconnect and it's, it's hard to express. Your face doesn't do what it's supposed to. It doesn't smile when you're happy. It, it, it can make faces that are not related to what you're feeling. And so to learn to be successful or, or connected in a human world uh, is, is, is hard and a long process. So I chose poetry. I chose this other thing. I wasn't as good at, at, at English when I started and I had to really develop my emotional center and my connectedness and my language centers. And, and anyway, so all of my books are about reconciling this. They're all, about, in a way, they're all about autism. And, uh, but, you'll, but you're seeing different growth phases. You're seeing like new attempts to understand or to grow or to, to develop. And uh, the other thing about me that's a little odd is that I was raised Christian by a Christian preacher, dad, a grandpa, but I'm a Buddhist. <laughs> so in trying to understand myself and the world, I traveled the world and I lived in different countries and I spent a lot of time in temples and mosques and uh, churches and, and everything and uh, meditating all over the world and, and in tribes, in the jungle and different places. And I became Buddhist. And so the other thing that's happening is this, this effort to reconcile a Christian foundation with Buddhist um, new, new learnings. And so the world is both as it appears, and it's also uh, in the interconnectedness and flow of Buddhist time. Uh, historic, there's the historic dimension and the ultimate dimension, where it's Apollonian Greek and Dionysian Greek. There's the flux and flow and everything is interconnected or everything is separate. And so both simultaneously, is sort of the art of living. And, and, and my poems are always trying to go back and forth. So the new project, <laughs> the, the reason that I'm telling you all that is that the new project is a book in the future tense, a book length, a sentence long that begins on the word or and ends on the word or. So that time, it's a book of prophecy, but not in the linear medieval sense where time is only one possible trajectory forward and you can see a future. This is quantum physics time. So I'm trying to reconcile the medieval linear time and destiny with what we know about time now and cause and effect through quantum physics. And so this is a reconciliation of the lived life as a human being and also this kind of physics part of my brain that's fascinated by, uh, by cause and effect and leptons and muons and quarks and strange attractors and all the things that happen at a subatomic level. So this is uh, many things at once. I'm also interested in religion so much that this is this is what I'm calling mythic humanism because I love prophecy and I love parables and I love uh, fairy tales, but I want to connect that to us doing dishes at the kitchen. I want to connect that to giving birth and to being in prison and to living the daily life. So I'm thinking of this as mythic humanism where individuals live their daily lives in a kind of grand godlike nobility, even as they take out the trash. So this book <laughs> reconciles all these things and it's a theory of time and as cause and effect, multiple causes, multiple effects, uh, branching and bifurcating and reforming. And anyway, that's what it is. So uh, it's sort of my lifelong fascination and I'm finally doing it all at once. I've been working on this for seven years now and um, I've sent it to a couple of presses and I'm starting and I've published some in magazines. I'm starting to get to the point where some of it's getting finished. So let me share this with you. Um, some of this work, and I, I guess I'll just read it so that you're not distracted by the, by looking at the words, maybe just hear the words, maybe I should share it. No, I'll just read it to you. So 
so here we go or so it starts on or <laughs> or three days from now you'll get up and cough and spit and push the lever that sets birds loose from sleep so in some ways it's written in like the tradition of say Nostradamus or the book of revelations or any of these big prophecies except it's like really some really ordinary stuff happens <laughs> Uh, or three days from now, you'll get up and cough and spit and push the lever that sets the birds loose from sleep. The machinery of pigeons revolving above bridges, the colors drawing up from underground to take their places on the hems of skirts and on the waters. And you'll tug the cords of gravity to pull luck toward you, to disentangle the possibles from the probables. And the myriad loves will thank you God help us so early in the morning. I lost my place. Hang on. Or you'll place tender pauses in prisons, an inch of air above the mouths of the dying, bruised air, flower of the mouth, windowed air, the mouths kissing it, and arcs and circles of leaves in the acacia will mirror the dome of the sky where this low earth wind rustling of lilacs beside the refinery will reflect a higher wind in heaven where our actions go on beyond us. Or a child will be born in the grief district of New Orleans and her name will be no hope anywhere. Or we'll pray all night for rain or we'll pray all night that a second moon be placed in the sky over hell or the colors of candle flames in hell be unbearable casting gravity and bronze rings over a city of weeping lovers, asking, what have we done? Or hell be a sidewalk in Cleveland where a man carries his body like a locked suitcase, or a Messiah will save us at last from waiting for Messiahs to save us, or a new kind of hero to swoop down on the safe. And one angel will be called Saigon, and one angel will be called El Paso, and one angel will be called Damascus, and one angel will be called Detroit, and their voices will murmur against the prows of boats, and their cries will sound as the sounds of cities. And one angel will be called Aleppo, and one angel will be called Pittsburgh, and this graveyard be a feeble navy guarding our sleep against the holy vastness of night. Or every thousand years, God will say one word into the blur of tires on wet pavement or the cum cries of lovers. Or God will say, look down, wash the ants off your feet. Or God will say nothing into the hush of icebergs melting. Or icebergs will drift into New York Harbor and the water in our bodies will bow. If the cotton crops fail, if the wheat crops fail, if Oklahomans wander forever among the back lots of Hollywood, if the potato crops fail, if the corn crops fail, if the sun corrodes a copper mirror, our faces afloat above a crib in Guadalajara where the ceiling fan rends our voices and the secret lives of aloe roots confess to a window in feathers of ice. Then the bluebells yawning up in the ruts of mining roads will measure the border wall in the serene apotheosis of their sepals. And one drop of my blood will freeze in the eye of an old fox. And one drop from your eye thaw to feed the iris bulbs, three beads from our lungs inhaled by a prisoner in the electric chair, a queen in a fairy tale, a farmer planting mines east of her field. If the gears of the clouds say yes, if ants flow up and down the funnels of evolution, then time will prism into its possibles. And you'll end up in a bar in Alabama, a cherry in your mouth, watching a hotel key float toward you. Or you'll wake in a labyrinth called Monday, called your life, called the things you prayed for. And your intricate decisions will lead you out and deeper in, your mirrors dissolving in ghost water. And your indecisions will go on subtracting numbers from the garden and building houses in the air. Or the hours will drift sideways. You'll be old in Texas, imbroglios of fire tracing the objects in your kitchen, the pain in your teeth, the pain of all that never will fissure the windows when trucks rattle past. Or each time you marry, seven veils float as egrets over the delta, and each day will hold you like this your eyes 
shocked open by love, or your most intimate moment will be preparing your father's body for the wake, touching his jawline, his cheek, the swelling in the neck, to loosen his tie, his hair, brushing it over, the cotton in his mouth, his eyelids taped shut, sorry, Father, his eyebrows penciled in, sorry, Father, Jesus, help me, the bruises in purple bloom, weeping and orphaned, and you will be the one to do this one morning while the choir rehearses for paradise in the next room. And so, uh, my, my belief is that grammar or the sentence, the sentence is a measure of cause and effect and a unit of perceptions. The way we speak, I think of as also the way we think. And my belief is that we, as human beings, our limitation is in seeing into time more deeply. So as long as the sentence is short, as long as you think this causes this, you're missing everything else in the intricate, uh, multiplicities and multifoliate chevrons of time and effect. And so many things are happening and they're causing many effects. And so what kind of a sentence would that be? <laughs> the sentence of everything. It would be a grammar that branches and bifurcates. And the problem with language is that it's linear. One word follows the next. And so in poetry, we call this the sensorium. All the senses happen at the same time, but in language, you can only show them sort of one at a time. You can show one thing happening at a time. So, I, so I've created this book length sentence that expands and opens up. And as the book goes on, the grammar gets more and more complicated. It starts to break down and shatter. It shatters against its own limits. And so it gets harder and harder to read it, <laughs> but it also becomes sort of rhapsodic. So um, let me just jump right closer to the end. And I'll just read a tiny, tiny bit to share uh, what, what starts to happen to the language. Let me do a screen share. You can see if I screen share it, then you can see it. I'll show you a little bit of what it looks like. Let's see, I'm gonna sh shorten this by jumping down here. Uh, and the hour will prism into its possibles. This shoe, a star and the rat, this cirrus, a bluebell and the median, this galleon's hull, a cello vibrating, one time's inch of it, one second of deer, one hour of cataract, one century of butterfly, to know the city by yes light and all of it at once light, to cross time fields and time bogs by flax light and lung light and swan light, by loss light and sound light and the coming and going of the sea of atoms blowing us hollow. And what we call erosion will only be the singing of a mountain in praise and lament. And then let me jump down here. And you'll remember the futures as easily as oars enter the water. The wood entering, the water receiving, the rower's heart, the rower's father entering the water, the reflections of a day, each sun one and numberless, the waters numberless and one, the clouds, the roots, your eye and its tides, the hand and its hours, the wasp and its wings, the cafe and its daying, the station by century, the meadows be monthing, the delta by decades, the mountains by millennia in motion, the boats by morning, the herds will wintering, the crows will futuring, the faces be raining, the stones will billowing the clouds by weeks all forward the lakes and lilacs and star years through cadences rolling my dearling life your fins will stir my dust your feather brush my stone your horn will call my hooves your water carry my pollen your mud reflect migrations your dark will hard my sleep oh i can hear someone my sleep long blessing your web will house my eggs your shell record my tides your bark deliver my fire long blessing your sand dunes moving back and forth across the highway will resemble doors and glass houses and then it um <laughs> that's enough for now <laughs> so it 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 gets it it's stretching my capacity to see my belief is that in seeing into a grammar like that, we, be, we can begin to see cause and effect in a more grand elastic way. So this is, this is what I mean by the reconciliation of a kind of an autistic mind fascinated by physics and an emotional mind that's trying to love and connect and understand people more fully. And the work does those things for me. And uh, so it's both important personally and hopefully 
useful to, to readers somewhere. So that's what I'm working on. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Sweeney. Thank you again to Dr. Cavallero, Dr. Davidson, Dr. Sweeney. We have like maybe a couple minutes if someone has a question that they like to bring to one of our speakers or I was thinking, Chad, I don't want my students to see a book length, one sentence document with their <laughs> Dr. Chang has a question. Dean Chong. Ron has yeah. a question. Maybe Ron, you go oh. first. You're muted, Ron. Someone's calling me. Let me turn it off. I just want to make a very general comment. I, I think uh, this is very exciting, and I've learned so much from each of the three presenters Alexandria and Jane. Wonderful work. I have a question for Chad about a millennium ago, you and I were talking about second person point of view, I expressed some suspicion and you seem to indicate that someday you are going to write something in a second person point of view. I used to thinking about that project. And uh, in addition to something like what you did today, future tense, multi, multi, multiplicity of dimensions, what have you, all right. As my well yeah th this is the project i i wanted to talk to you about how time was represented in various <laughs> languages from the point of view of a linguist and you were talking so i've 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 looked at how different languages do it <laughs> in order to try to find a, a grammar that can stretch us forward into into new seeing it's almost like the language is a type of perception the language perceives and so by expanding like the like the capacity for language and its stretchiness, I thought we could see deeper into time. And B Buddhism does it through parables. Buddhism does it through koans, like what's the sound of one hand clapping? That's that's means as much as my entire book. My book doesn't mean as much as that because the sound of one hand clapping, the answer is is the answer to everything. But to see deeper into cause and effect, Buddhism tends to do it through parables. So I'm trying to do it directly. Uh, with both parables and also direct line. Anyway, so I approached Ron, and that's what it is, Ron. It's a, <laughs> it's definitely, and, and it's, this is a failure. I just want you guys to know, I cannot write this book. This is, my, the best effort I can make is a failure. And so it's a terrifying feeling that I'm just not up to it. I'm just not smart enough to do what I wish I could do. And that's uh, exciting and also terrifying because I just have, I'm at the limit. And I approach linguists to try to figure out how do I see beyond what my limit is? And I, you know, anyway, so I think that's kind of what's interesting about it. And what I would, what I would give to students is to keep pushing, finding that limit and pushing against it and to try to fail more beautifully, <laughs> try to fail closer to uh, something of value. <laughs> that's great. Thank you, Chad. Dean Chong, you had a question. I just want to thank three remarkable presenters for, for showcasing your research, and especially at this juncture where you reached the, the big milestone, right? Getting promotion to associate professor, and promoted to full professor. So I just wanna ask you, what will be your next step? You know, you shared some of your most proud of your, your research, your academic achievement. So what will be your, your next big, you know, big project will be like? Oof, asking the hard questions. Okay. Um, so what I personally want to do is um, I'm trying to kind of figure out the next direction for this archive and what I want to do with this archive. I had thought originally that I wanted to turn it into a book length academic monograph, and I may still go in that direction. But I've also been sort of thinking about um, taking the work to a, a more public audience as opposed to just an academic one. So for me, I think my, my next step is to think about 
what pieces of this work I want to write about for an, for an academic audience and you know maybe submit to scholarly journals, potentially do a book length project, and what pieces I want to you know share in different ways. And I actually don't know what that looks at yet. I plan to sort of collaborate with, um, with colleagues who are more experienced in that sort of thing um, than I am to sort of bring awareness to um, this population and, and the things that they're doing. Great. Thank you. How about Dr. Jane Jean Davidson or Chad? Yeah, well, thanks, Raylene, for asking that. I um, well, number one, I becoming a full professor, I I felt like I've been really sort of um, selfishly working and hardly ever giving back administratively. And so I've really reached out this year. Um, I'm working on um, the assessment uh, committee this year. And also I've just been um, roped into, or not roped into, but, you know, <laughs> helping with DEI. Um, and, um, but, but in terms of my research, I still work a lot. I still um, write and produce a lot. So I now um, have been invited to be on several editorial boards. And the one I'm most excited about is the Women's Echo Artists Dialogue, um, which is like a 25 year old project that is really activist um, in terms of environmental advocacy. And they uh, actually published this really gl amazing global journal. So I'm, I'm really heavily involved. I just got asked to do that. I'm really heavily involved in that, but I do want to continue to work in um, writing about environmental issues from a feminist point of view. I mean, there's a few, few of us who believe that this is a very gendered thing, um, that climate change and power structures are immensely connected. Um, and so th this is uh, this is like a passion project that I get to think about next in instead of you know, continuing on my original vein of, of global expositions and performance. But thanks so much for asking. Good luck with your echo feminism research. It can go a different direction, maybe connecting to arts, right? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Dr. Sweeney? So, um, well, I, I just, I, spent, I talked a lot about that project. So I have to finish that and I'll probably never will, but I'll try. But I'm also writing a novel um, I've been teaching fiction as well, and I get so excited teaching fiction that I decided I really, I just have to write a novel too. So I'm trying to de-emphasize the, the Western heroic individual rather, so I'm showing a community inter, interconnected human community instead, where every character interrelates with every other character. And uh, it's very um, diverse and Inland Empire uh, San Bernardino characters that know each other in the neighborhood and, and I'm moving in and out of their different points of view and it, but again I'm stretching time several of my books stretch time long so there are these long sentences and 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 so it's um again the representation of time as an infinite ripple on a surface rather than being bifurcated so even in the novel it's a little bit experimental in the way that I'm sort of formatting it <laughs> And I, and I hope people can read it. The, the great thing about being a professor now, being tenured and being a full professor is that I, I can actually be an artist. I don't have to worry as much about publishing, publishing, publishing on, a, on, a, on a, a rapid scale. So to me, that means I can develop things more fully and I can take risks. I can write things that may never be published because they're too weird. <laughs> and that gives me this wonderful freedom to finally explore what's possible. And so it's sort of a lifelong dream to be a professor and to be in this position where I can, you know, and I think that's, I think the best art could probably only happen when it's, when there's that risk involved. Uh, the, so, so I don't have to constantly try to finish a product and then publish it and prove it, prove it right away before it's even fully finished, which, which may have, have been a pressure in the past. Now, uh, anyway, so I'm very grateful to be here and I and I just I love this life all of you guys we do so much good work I think with students and also all the admin stuff that you know Jane got roped into but it's so important 
<laughs> she gave away her <laughs> rope did. But uh, no, it's, I'm teasing. So it's such important work. We're all interconnected in this and we never get to see the fullness of our effort in life. We, we just get to see our one little part. But because of the work we do, we hold up the sky. Each of us is like a pillar holding up the sky. Though we have cracks, we still hold it up. <laughs> and that's why I just feel such gratitude. Despite all the miseries of the world, I still feel a lot of gratitude and hope for us. So thanks, thanks to everybody. I think that was very well put because I mean, these are great opportunities for us to see the bigger picture and see what everybody else is doing. It's one of the things that I really enjoy about, like I said at the start about the College Evaluation Committee and these sorts of events, it really puts a more rewarding perspective on, on the work that we do. So thank you to each of you and thanks Dean Chong and Diana for organizing this and getting the word out. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I think with that, enjoy your rest of your Friday afternoon and have a great weekend, everybody. Enjoy the wonderful weather we've been having. Thank you, Dr. Heister Kam, for sitting on the very, very important college evaluation committee where you 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 pretty much you read and read, you know, all those um, big important files. People put their life into it. They sweat so much, right? And so this is very, very important work. So thank you so much for serving on the college evaluation committee and also college curriculum committee. Both committee have a tremendous impact on the future of the, the college and, and also faculty, their own professional life or departmental programs in their life. So thank you so much for serving on those very important committee and serving as our facilitator for today's remarkable presentation. Okay. I hope you all have a nice weekend. Thank you again for attending today's amazing panel presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. See you later. Thank you, Chad. Good luck with your long sentences, folks. Remember Thomas Mann, right, who won the Nobel Prize? Yes. You know, the Germans, they write very long sentences. And Thomas Mann is a great example of someone who won the Nobel Prize for very long sentences. It can complex. happen. It can yes. be done. <laughs> All right. Take care. Bye -bye. Good luck. Thank you so much, Bye. Taylor. Thank you so much, Teddy. Thank you so much, Diana and Emily, for helping out. Bye-bye.